Whenever things got rough, I always remember what my father used to say. Running a business does test a man, my son. There are ups and downs. Glorious eyes. And sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated. The character of a man and the character of a business are not very different, are they? Yes. But when the chips are down, we must stand up. Dust ourselves off and motor on. Volatility. It's a funny thing. It makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions. Sure, you can question some of your decisions, but stay steadfast on your goals. Dad always said, there are no shortcuts and no quick profits. There are no free lunches, are there? There is only one right way. At PPFAS, we think like Rahul and his father. That volatility is a fact of running a business. And buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business. We use value investing principles to manage your money. This means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term. PPFAS Mutual Fund. There's only one right way. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. We have a debut speaker today, uh, who's Rohil. So Hello. he's part of our research team at PPFAS. Thank you. And uh, in our team, we keep having these internal presentations uh, where uh, each person works on a sector or a that, set of companies, that. and they present internally. Uh, so this presentation was. Uh, we felt that it would be of interest to. Uh, the FOF members as well. So that's how he's here. Royal, you. all yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking your time and being here today. Uh, so just before we start, the dates for the next two FOFs are on the screen, 19th November and 19th December. So if you all can just take that down. So, uh, can anyone tell me the significance of the two dates on the screen right now? Uh, October 29, 2018 and March 10, 2019. Uh, I'll just give you a hint. I'm not sure if that's clear, but anyone? Yeah. Yeah, so yes, that's correct. That's correct. So, it's the crashing dates. Uh, so, Boeing 737 MAX, there were two crashes with the Lion Air and the Ethiopian Airlines. So, we're going to be talking about the aerospace industry in general today. Uh, so this industry has been in focus because of the crashes uh, as well as some engine issues in the Airbus fleet with the Pratt and Whitney engines. Or in the Indian context, if you will, then uh, the downfall of Jet Airways and uh, the cash crunch at Air India. So we're just going to have a brief look at uh, how this industry works. So before I get to the presentation, uh, just a little bit about the two crashes. So it claimed the lives of 346 people. Uh, and MCAS is the software that was uh, responsible for causing these crashes. So I'm not going to get into the de uh, details as to why this software uh, failed. But I can tell you what, uh, what some statements were made after the two crashes. So Firstly, three weeks after the second crash, around March 19, uh, 29th uh, of 2019, the then deputy uh, administrator for the Federal Aviation Authority, he said that uh, this particular software, MCAS, which it was being self-regulated by Boeing at that time, rather than uh, being certified by uh, a central authority, uh, for the airworthiness of the plane, this particular software was being uh, regulated by Boeing themselves. There was no uh, governmental agency that was looking into that. So to defend this policy, this person called Daniel Elwell, he said that uh, there was a lack of funding with, the, uh, with that particular uh, agency of $1.8 billion and they would have required 10,000 people more. So now in hindsight, firstly, it has claimed so many lives and it has impacted so many more. 
and uh, Boeing in the second quarter this year, financially speaking, has uh, uh, taken a hit of 5.6 billion dollars, which is three times the uh, lack of funding so claimed by the deputy administrator at that time. Also, there are reports in the press that uh, Boeing was continuously pressurizing the governmental agencies to give the 737 MAX the approval to come into uh, service because its competitor Airbus had already launched the A320neo at that time and it had been in service since nine months already. So they were losing out on a lot of market. So the issue is not whether they should have uh, a central agency looking into uh, the airplanes and each and every software. But more importantly, do Boeing and Airbus today have too much dominance and too much independence in the markets? So to understand this, we have to understand how the industry works. So I'll be taking you through that. So I highly recommend uh, this book uh, called Boeing vs. Airbus. It's written by John Newhouse. So it was published in 2008. And uh, this particular book will give you a good understanding as to the history of the aerospace industry from when Boeing started and how Airbus and Boeing have become such intense rivals over the last couple of decades. So just a little bit on the history for Boeing and Airbus. So Boeing was incorporated in 1916 and initially it started off as a uh, fighter jet manufacturer and defense uh, defense goods for the US government during the world war. So the main source of revenue was just uh, the defense segment. But after that they started hauling mail for the US government and later they once post the world wars uh, they tried to get into the commercial aircraft operations uh, so as to better use their cap uh, capacities. Also, uh, in 1970, looking at the potential that Boeing, uh, Boeing had in terms of earning foreign exchange uh, revenue for the country, uh, the European uh, countries came together and formed an agreement to uh, incorporate Airbus as the main competitor and have somebody come challenge Boeing. So just to give you a context, today uh, the aerospace industry in general accounts for 9% of uh, US exports. So that is the level of importance that this segment has uh, in US itself. So uh, 1978 uh, again marked another important year for uh, the aerospace industry. So in this year in the US, uh, they deregulated the, uh, they de there was a deregulation act passed. So because of, because of this act, it allowed the airline operators to set their own fares rather than being dictated by the central government. Now, however, in hindsight, it has been claimed by a lot of people and there were, uh, there were efforts made to uh, re-regulate uh, re this particular sector because this led to intensive price wars that we see today uh, amongst all the airline operators that, uh, that are there in existence. And that has led to the downfall of several of these operators as well. And 2003 was the first year when Airbus uh, ever overtook Boeing in terms of the deliveries that they make. And subsequently, some complaints were filed with the World Trade Organization due to the uh, subsidies that were being provided to Airbus uh, at that time uh, so that it can help them compete with Boeing. So just the general business model, uh, more like an understanding as to how the industry works. Uh, the aircraft manufacturers, that is Boeing and Airbus, they manufacture the air, uh, airplanes and assemble them and they either sell it to the leasing companies or the airline operators directly. When they sell it to the leasing companies, they sell it in bulk and which is later on uh, uh, distributed, uh, uh, given to different airline operators for a lease rent on a per month basis. Also another part, so this is like a normal manufacturing operation till now. However, we have something called maintenance operations of these aircraft. So these aircraft have to be uh, maintained uh, and serviced ve uh, very frequently uh, so as to maintain their airworthiness. So this is, this is something that helps Boeing and Airbus uh, generate some recurring revenue based on the number of aircraft that they have already sold in the past. So, and uh, MRO segment or maintenance and repairs organization, uh, operation, sorry, uh, this is a highly profitable, like 
higher margin business so it helps them maintain a higher profitability level as well so it is a critical component of their business model so what are the different components of an air, uh, airplane and how much do they cost coming up to uh, the, like when you assemble the entire airplane so your assembly integration uh, at the Boeing Airbus level accounts for only 28% of the total cost whereas the engines on your airplanes account for another 20% the aircraft systems interiors and avionics they account for another 19% Aerostructure is another uh, component, critical component, which is comprised of fuselage, wings, nacelle, and controls. So fuselage and wheels, uh, wings are considered to be more specialized areas wherein the company can gain some competitive advantage over the uh, over their uh, over Airbus or Boeing, whichever way. So just some of the key players in the market today, uh, you have Boeing and Airbus. Generally, this industry is more or less dominated by these two up to at least 90% with Embraer, Bombardier, uh, Comac or the Commercial Aircraft Corporation of China, Mitsubishi Aircraft, so that is uh, the Japanese uh, manufacturer, ATR and United Aircraft Corporation, so that is the Rus uh, Russian manufacturer. So there are fears that due to the recent trends of outsourcing the wings and the fuselage, there are fears that these uh, new players can uh, get the technology right and uh, compete with Boeing and Airbus at a future date. Some of the top aero engine companies are United Technologies, General Electric, Rolls-Royce and Safran Group. So something interesting about the engine space in the aerospace uh, in this particular industry is that I have seen a lot of internal JVs uh, amongst themselves for certain niche uh, segments like the Airbus 380 engine or so on so as to so that they can save a lot of R&D costs and so on. So some of the key joint ventures have been international aero engines so which is a joint venture between Pratt & Whitney, Japanese aero engines and MTO aero engines. So earlier even Rolls-Royce used to be part of this JV. CFM International is a 50-50 JV between General Electric and Safran Group. And Engine Alliance is another JV between Pratt & Whitney and General Electric. So you can see how General Electric is also a part of two different JVs. So they, uh, they do have a lot of these JVs uh, forming uh, within, this, uh, within this industry. Just based on ranking, uh, the top aircraft leasing companies uh, in the world today uh, are General Electric, Aircap, Avalon, uh, Fly Leasing, and Nordic Aviation. Uh, Ellie's Corp is uh, ranked 19, but it was found by Stephen Udwa Hazy, who had earlier founded International Lease Finance Corp, which was earlier acquired by Aircap. Uh, so these are some of the top players who buy it in bulk, and in the Indian context also, uh, most of the airline operators they tend to lease the aircrafts so these guys are really important players in that sense to provide the financing arrangements for these airline operators so what the basic raw material for an aircraft uh, till a certain time was aluminium and steel which used to account for 75 percent of the commercial uh, aircraft's weight however the 787 dreamliner and the A350 were game changers because more than 50% of that aircraft was built by composites and other materials uh, like titanium. So what this actually helped, like what we see in the auto industry today, especially in Europe, that they're trying to lightweight this, uh, lightweight the cars so as to improve fuel efficiency. So the logic remains the same here that with the uh, compos uh, composites, they try to lightweight the aircrafts so so that uh, so that they could improve the fuel efficiency for those aircrafts so how can you differentiate aircraft so there are different kinds of aircraft so they're generally differentiated based on various parameters uh, one is range which is generally calculated in nautical miles so one nautical mile is roughly 1.8 kilometers uh, the number of the number of seats or the passenger seating capacity uh, or the cargo capacity if it's a freighter airplane, the number of engines and the seating configuration. So seating configuration can be either single, dual or triple. So it depends on the airline operator's choice. So uh, what this means is they can have either only economy 
economy and premier economy or economy first class and business class so these are called seating configuration so that's how they can differentiate but this is more on a airline operator level but generally the parameter used is the range and the passenger seating capacity so uh, i'm not sure if this slide is visible so let me just try and sum it up uh, so the single aisle aircraft so this is generally your aircraft where you have a configuration of three and three on each side and this in today's in-service fleet this accounts for 77 percent of the entire fleet however within this also there are two broad segments uh, one where airbus and uh, boeing dominate uh, which is a slightly higher passenger seating capacity and one is a smaller regional aircraft which is embraer and bombardier uh, dominated so Airbus and Boeing account for 65% and they, uh, their uh, aircrafts are generally seat anywhere from 120 to 200 passengers and can travel uh, roughly 3 to 4,000 nautical miles. Whereas Embraer and Bombardier, they can seat maximum from 60 to 120 passengers. So that is the difference mainly. The range is somewhat similar uh, from 2,000 to 3,000 nautical miles. Another key takeaway is that if you see the engines, so uh, CFM and Pratt and & Whitney are present across all these uh, aircraft manufacturers and they are the two main uh, players within this particular single aisle aircraft segment. And uh, yeah, so uh, CFM is again the JV between General Electric and Safran Group. So why are single aisle airplanes important and why will this mix not necessarily shift like uh, reduce from 77% going forward. So some of the reasons are, uh, firstly, it leads to higher service revenue. So uh, generally, when you drive a car, the longer you drive it or the more you drive it, there is more wear and tear for the car, correct? But in an aircraft scenario, that is not the only deciding factor. It also depends upon the number of landings and takeoffs that the airplane goes through. And since these smaller aircrafts, they're prone to smaller journeys, like smaller distances, they generally land up uh, uh, more, they have more takeoffs and landings, leading to much more wear and tear. And this leads to much more recurring revenue for Boeing and Airbus as well. Secondly, uh, this allows for spoke to spoke flights for the consumers. So rather than having people from various des destinations come to Mumbai as a hub and then collectively taking them to one particular final destination. Uh, a smaller aircraft allows for a uh, lower number of passengers at each airport and therefore take them directly to their final destination rather than having them pull up at one central hub. So this has led to an increase in demand uh, for the uh, consumers, from the consumers uh, side as well and lower fares as well. Faster turnaround times, uh, so generally these smaller aircrafts, it is easier to, uh, so when, when they're parked at the airport, there are some airport charges that, uh, that, that they have to incur and pay the airport. So the faster they can turn it around and take a, uh, and fly out of the aircraft, uh, uh, of the airport, the better it is because it's lower cost and they can make more trips so that uh, they can earn more revenue. Uh, and demand from low, uh, for lower fares. So in emerging market economies, the majority of these countries are a lot of uh, a lot price sensitive. So in that case, to have a smaller aircraft wherein you can save on certain costs and have the fares at as low as let's say in the Indian scenario as low as four thousand rupees, it is easier to generate demand, and therefore the demand for such uh, airplanes is much higher compared to the larger aircrafts. So twin aisle aircrafts, uh, which are generally your 343 three seating arrangements, uh, they account for 23% of the in-service fleet today. And in this particular segment, you will only find Boeing and Airbus who operate. So in this segment, they generally carry those long distances and uh, they can accommodate from 240 to 400 odd passengers. And the main two engine makers in this particular uh, industry, uh, in this particular segment, are Rolls-Royce and General Electric. So going back uh, based on uh, to see the market share and how it's moved across the engine makers, the uh, CFM International is the most dominant player with roughly 45 to 50% market share, with General Electric 
uh, standalone also having a roughly 20% market share. So General Electric is clearly a very uh, important player in this particular industry. Engine Alliance, Pratt & Whitney and Rolls-Royce also have sizable market shares in this segment. So across Boeing, uh, Embraer, and uh, Embraer, Bombardier and Airbus, the market share has roughly remained constant over the past few, uh, within this decade itself. So the market share has been more or less 90% with Boeing and Airbus. But again, recent trends uh, have allowed for Boeing and Airbus to capture more market share. And I'll tell you why. So uh, M uh, Bombardier had this uh, aircraft series called the C-Series. And that had a lot of delays leading to a cash crunch. So they had to eventually sell it to uh, Airbus. So Airbus now has a partial stake in Bombardier's C-Series, which they've renamed to the Airbus 220. And they have further options to buy out uh, uh, Bombardier's stake. So in response to this, Boeing had to also do something and they proposed to buy Embraer's uh, commercial aviation unit. So that is the entire 6% market share that you see on the slide. That uh, the entire commercial aviation unit is pro being proposed to buy, uh, to being bought by Boeing themselves. So now this is only stock because of the competition commission right now because of the tariff wars that are happening between US and Europe. But uh, ideally they're expected to go through. So if that happens, then you will actually see a duopoly in this market rather than seeing somebody else with more than 2-3% market share. So just as a forecast, what is the size of the market going forward uh, from... So Airbus and Boeing, uh, these players in this industry generally make a 20-year hor uh, forecast horizon. Now, however, we think that 20 years is too long. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But uh, in this case, because the replacement cycles are generally known, as well as the order books being seven to eight years long, they do have a fair idea as to what the demand would be going forward. So the current total uh, in-service fleet today is 21,450 aircrafts, from which they expect only 10,600 to remain at the end of 20, uh, 2037. However, uh, remaining 37,400 aircrafts is what they're expecting the new uh, new production to be and that amounts to a total value of 5.8 trillion dollars over the next 20 years to be shared mainly between Boeing and Airbus so what the so region specific what the uh, forecast is uh, you see the mix today Asia Pacific accounts for 33 percent of the total in service fleet Within Asia Pacific, you have India, China, and Japan, which are the three main countries with the sizable fleets. Uh, North America and Europe accounting for another 23% each. So going forward, however, they expect 43% of the new demand to come mainly from Asia Pacific. So clearly, Asia Pacific is going to be a key driver for their revenues going forward. And based on the volumes, the implied uh, Kega growth for these regions uh, have been uh, um, uh, calculated. So for Asia Pacific, they're estimating roughly 5.5% Kega growth over the next 20 years. So uh, I happen to visit this site called Air Finance Journal. So they give you per airline what is the uh, fleet mix uh, in terms of Boeing, Airbus, and any other uh, manufacturer. So based on that region specific, I uh, took out the top uh, operators in that region. So for example, North America had American Airlines, Delta, Southwest, U, uh, United, and so on. So based on that, I tried to understand what is the region specific market share of these two companies. So North America, roughly 55% is with Boeing, uh, another 20% with Airbus. In Asia Pacific, it's more or less balanced. But however, in this also, it's important to note that uh, Japan, uh, most of the uh, Japanese operators, they have all Airbus fleets, uh, sorry, all Boeing fleets. And in India, you will see majority of the operators having all Airbus fleets. So based on which country actually goes ahead tomorrow and has a faster growth, you will see the demand also skewed in that way and the market share could also shift in that uh, specific region. So how long does it take for an aircraft manufacturer to, uh, from 
conceptualization to actual delivery and flight. So if we take the, it, it's roughly seven to 10 years uh, that they take. And uh, if you take the example of Boeing 777X, so the program was launched in 2013. And as for this slide, it shows that it was estimated that the first uh, delivery would be in 2019. However, this has been delayed because of certain supply chain issues. So the moment any critical component supplier like the engines, uh, engine manufacturers, if, uh, if there is any issue at their end also, this leads to a delay in launching that particular product and this leads to a lot of deferred production costs for these companies. So some of the ways that they try and save on costs uh, are they try to have the same fuselage across various models so that they can have economies of scale. They, uh, so Airbus has started something called new engine options. Uh, so uh, if you are traveling by any aircraft and you see that you're traveling by A320 new, it means that the operator had an option to choose between two different uh, engine manufacturers. And last, uh, the commercial aircrafts that you fly on. So they generally can be used for a period of seven to 10 years before they can be repurposed into a freighter aircraft. So this helps to save the uh, cost on manufacturing a completely new freighter aircraft as well as for uh, somebody like a FedEx who is buying these uh, aircraft. So they can have a, mi a mix of completely fresh aircraft and uh, flights, uh, aircraft that have been repurposed. So this helps them save on costs as well. So if you're ever analyzing an a uh, aircraft or uh, airline operator, then it's important to know what their cash flow schedule is in terms of payments that they have to make. Uh, so this is mainly when you have a direct sale from uh, the ma engine, uh, from the aircraft manufacturer to the airline operator. So roughly two to five percent is paid uh, when the firm order is contracted, uh, when they place the final order, and thirty percent is paid in advance in equal installments of ten percent, all six months apart. And the balance, sixty-five to sixty-eight percent, is paid uh, around the time of the delivery. So uh, as I said, uh, the maintenance and repair op uh, operations, this accounts for a critical portion uh, of their uh, profitability margin. So it accounts for, it's a critical component of their uh, entire business model. So how frequently are these maintenance checks undertaken? So if you see, there are different levels of checks that happen. Some which happen on a daily basis, some on a weekly basis, or some even oh, six to seven years apart. So the D or the heavy check is the most, uh, uh, they completely tear apart the uh, airplane from the inside. They check it for structural integrity again, and then they reassemble the entire aircraft. So if anybody is interested, please have a look at uh, this video. It's only one hour long, and it's on Prime Video, Amazon Prime. Uh, it's Boeing 777, the heavy check. Uh, so you can have a look at this particular video. So what are some of the factors that lead to the success of these uh, aircraft manufacturers? So they really need to have the mindset that every new model that they launch has to save on cost in terms of fuel efficiency for the airline operators. The airline operators only care about how fuel efficient your aircraft is going to be because the en uh, engine fuel uh, is a very major significant portion of the uh, profit and loss statement. After sales service and spare part availability uh, is again uh, to avoid the aircraft to go into maintenance uh, and out of service. So they need to keep a good uh, inventory level of, uh, these, but, uh, of the spare parts as well. So something very imp uh, important and interesting in this sector is generally in a manufacturing industry, it's just a uh, two-party uh, thing between the manufacturer and the final consumer, correct? But uh, however, government plays a very important role in this industry as well. Not just in terms of policy making, which is uh, very normal across all the industries, but in terms of government influence as well. So if today the US-China relations were to break down, you will see that in one way or another, the Chinese aircraft uh, airline operators 
they will refrain from buying any of Boeing's uh, airplanes because it causes a lot of foreign exchange earning for US as well. So in retaliation, they will try and go refer Airbus uh, fleets. So how the political relations are between countries also uh, play a major role in deciding where the demand is going to come from. Compatibility of the aircraft with the, uh, uh, with the airport. So another uh, interesting study in this, uh, on, on this is the Airbus 380. So the dual decker aircraft that we had, so that aircraft was so big uh, that the airport had to, had to actually make so, uh, certain changes uh, so that they can accommodate the aircraft and unload and load passengers quickly and more effectively. So if these manufacturers don't keep in mind as to uh, what the dimensions of the uh, aircraft is, what it happens is the aircraft would have to make a lot of capex in just to accommodate this particular aircraft which may not even have so many volumes or not fly out of that particular airport that frequently. So they would try and refrain from doing that which would again lead to the eventual downfall of the uh, aircraft. So in this case the Airbus 380 has not been so successful and therefore uh, they're going to stop production of that particular model in 2020-21. So some of the risks as we spoke about the level of government interference in terms of political relations or the policies, uh, these are common across majority of the industry. Uh, supply chain constraints as we said, uh, if General Electric were to have a supply chain inefficiency and they were not supplying their uh, engines to the manufacturers uh, with the, at the correct uh, schedule. That would lead to a lot of delays and uh, therefore deferred production costs. Legal issues and inventory planning. So inventory planning again is important. So today, uh, post the crashes of the 737 MAX, uh, Boeing continues to manufacture these aircrafts. They have been manufacturing at the rate of 40 per month and the planes were grounded back in uh, March. So today they have roughly 240 aircrafts uh, already sitting in their uh, parking lots and they are not able to sell it uh, to the final uh, aircraft, uh, airline, manuf uh, airline operator. So this inventory size itself comes up to a total cost of roughly uh, 7 to 10 billion dollars. So managing your inventory levels also becomes a key component uh, of the business model. So some of the common characteristics in this industry are mainly the J curve. So initially when a new aircraft or a new engine uh, is being launched, that time there are a lot of uh, production inefficiencies and, uh, and so on. So because of that you will see that at the initial phases, you will see a lot of discounting happening uh, across these new models. Uh, because of which the profitability of those uh, new engines or the new aircrafts is much lower but as the volume picks up for these uh, models they uh, they try and recover from the maintenance operations as well as through a better efficiencies in their production system so there is a high discounting whenever a new model is introduced which leads to a lot of margin volatility in those uh, few years as well Service revenue is again important to improve profitability and have a recurring source of revenue because uh, new aircraft will be, mass uh, the discount levels on those new aircrafts is really, really uh, high. It's as high as 40 to 50 percent of the original price. And retirements tend to increase when fuel prices are uh, high because of course you want more fuel efficient aircraft so you will tend to retire the uh, aircrafts at the airline operator level and uh, go and place orders for new ones. So just an interesting, so these are different models uh, in Boeing's portfolio. On the left hand side you will see mainly the 737 and the 737 MAX. So this is the single aisle aircraft uh, which are roughly uh, priced around 100 to 120 million dollars. And uh, on the next slide you have Airbus, uh, mainly the A318, uh, the A320 family which is A318, A319, 320 three, and the 321 as well as the NEOs. So the pricing is somewhat similar. But if you notice this is just the list price. So what they actually sell even uh, as on date the price of these aircrafts, what they actually realize is 40 to 50 percent lower than what they quote. 
So sometimes what happens is the backlog they used to earlier state, at least at Airbus, until last year they used to state the backlog in, or in terms of list prices. So the investor will never know exactly whether the list price is being used or the uh, actual prices that they're going to realize from the operators. And it depends on customer, customer to customer what the level of discounting is. So before I end on the uh, Boeing and Airbus side, it is important to understand this industry even from an accounting perspective. So uh, it would be... Uh, so it is important uh, because these uh, companies have different accounting standards which really be have to be understood and the risks that are associated with them. So just some of them uh, are the revenue and cost recognition methods, especially because Boeing and Airbus are uh, incorporated in different countries. The regulations and the accounting practices that they have to follow are completely different. Deferred production costs at Boeing. So this is something that is very unique. So because of the J curve, what they do is they uh, they state that some of these costs that they're incurring as on date, they will be able to recover this uh, due to the efficiencies that they will have, let's say five years down the line or when the volumes pick up. So they rather capitalize these costs rather than uh, ex uh, expensing them from the PNL statement. So some of these accounting practices really have to be understood and uh, uh, the risks associated with them also really need to be uh, kept, uh, need to be informed about. So, before, uh, so just to understand what the current Indian market scenario is as well. So, I've just put in a few slides. Uh, however, if you want to understand this particular sector a little more in detail, especially the aviation segment, aviation industry. So. Raji sir has done a talk on this in December 2015 when Indigo came out with its IPO. So uh, what I will be covering today in terms of the Indian Airlines is just a brief highlight. But he has spoken a little more in detail so you can uh, visit this video at any time. So what has been the market share across Indian Airlines? So the in the uh, photograph you will see the market share that is pre-Jet Airways fall. And on the right hand side, uh, post the downfall of Jet Airways. So Indigo has uh, improved its market share from 43 to more than 50% uh, as on date. So And uh, SpiceJet holds around 15% market share with Air India 13 and a half. Again, an interesting scenario because Air India is going through the cash crunch today. So how that market share uh, tends to move later on will be interesting to see. So just some of the performance metrics of these Indian airlines, uh, how punctual were they in terms of landings and takeoffs or the load factor. Load factor is nothing but the capacity utilization of these airlines. Uh, you will see that the load factors are pretty high, uh, mainly 85 and up. So while these capacity utilizations are really good, but it's not the same as you see any uh, other manufacturing company. So to understand why it is important to understand what are the different uh, cost line items for these airline operators. So what are the major costs for these operators? 36%, the biggest cost is the fuel. 36% of their uh, operating revenues roughly is just towards the, uh, the, fuels that, uh, the fuel that they have to buy. The employee or the flight crew cost comes up to another 26%. Maintenance, as we said earlier, it's a recurring revenue every year. They're going to have to maintain whether the, uh, the uh, aircraft is in service or not. Uh, it comes up to 10 plus 6, so that is 16% of their operating revenue. So if you just combine the flight crew cost and the maintenance revenue, that itself is 40% plus airport charges, so that comes to another 10% roughly. So 50% of their uh, uh, operating revenue is fixed cost and these are all cash basis. So in terms of operating leverage, there's a really high operating leverage and this does not take into account the interest that they'd have to pay on the debt that they, uh, and how levered their balance sheets actually are. But on the flip side, is there scope for these operators? Yes, there definitely is. So if you see the last line in the table, domestic passengers. So 
as on date in india there are 139 million passengers who have traveled domestically as compared to us which is roughly seven times higher and china another four to five times higher so there is definitely scope also these 139 million passengers is not unique passengers it is people who have taken return trips or have taken multiple trips as well so if you compare it to what the size of indian population is at 1300 million and from that even if you say that the addressable market is only 300 million there is still a lot of scope in terms of passenger volume going forward also if you see uh, so be, uh, luckily thanks to the ircdc rhp recently uh, you see the non suburban traffic which is basically intercity travel on railways the number is 3500 million passengers that is 25x the number of domestic passengers who have traveled by air so the differential is really really high so yeah just to sum up some of the characteristics within the indian aviation market this market is really price sensitive so for airlines to charge anything higher than 4000 becomes really uh, difficult because they lose out on demand very quickly but the moment the uh, the affairs are lower and even though your load uh, load factors are much higher it would not they would not make the peak profits because 4000 is roughly the price that helps them maintain uh, their profitability margins so that also becomes how the level of discounting and the number of offers that they give becomes very important to see over a period of time railways will always continue to be one of the biggest competitors as an alternate means of transport uh, considering it has 25 times the passenger traffic and but the biggest trade off here happens in terms of cost versus time uh, which we all know in this industry you can expect the top line growth mainly to happen due to passenger volume uh, because because of the price sensitive nature of the market so again something that is happening in today's market scenario is privatization of airports so what the airports authority of india has been doing so it has already privatized six airports wherein airport authority of india maintains only a 26% stake so this public private uh, partnership model has proven really effective because of which they have started to privatize and invite bids for more airports so like the mumbai airport it's already been privatized so they were invited uh, bids for roughly 15 to 20 airports uh, this summer itself so what uh, what the debate is among some uh, amongst uh, certain industry veterans are that the more efficient that these airports become what it will lead to is lowering of the airport charges for these uh, airline operators and if that happens then it gives them a slightly more leeway in terms of uh, air price uh, the fare, uh, ticket pricing also the choice of fleet is influenced by what the competitor is using so today indigo having 50% market share because their fleet is mainly airbus what happens is to uh fly an airbus versus a different model uh, let's say boeing you need to train the pilots in a different manner and this costs money so if a new uh, entrant or a very small player in that sense wants to really scale up they would ideally prefer to have the same aircraft as the market leader so that they can poach certain pilots from indigo and so on of course the risk will always be that that the reverse could also happen but uh, this is the best way rather than to train uh, train new uh, pilot uh, train the pilots and the new uh, aircrafts rather than, uh, rather than uh, doing that you have uh, you just directly get them from other airlines leasing of aircraft so at least interglobe aviation so that is indigo spicejet and air asia these three for certain are use uh, are leasing their aircrafts and the general term of the lease is roughly 6 to 12 years and the lease rentals that they land up paying per month is roughly 300000 uh, dollars uh, per month depends again what aircraft they use are they using an older aircraft or a relatively new aircraft so these are some of the things that you really need to keep in mind so i'll just end with a quote from benjamin graham obvious prospects for physical growth in a business do not translate into obvious profits for investors 
there is definitely scope in the airlines industry in terms of the passenger growth. We see the differentials that is there amongst countries and even within uh, airway, airlines uh, versus the railways. But that does not necessarily mean that they will lead to a lot more profits and uh, outperformance compared to Sensex or Nifty. In fact, last year in 2019 itself, the revenue growth at uh, Indigo and SpiceJet was roughly 20%, uh, but their EBITDA level, at the EBITDA level, they really underperformed and there was degrowth uh, at, at that level. That was mainly due to the rise in the fuel prices. So when you go back with 50% plus being fixed prices, that does not even account for the rise in or the volatility of the crude oil or any uh, charges that they have to land up paying in uh, if they're hedging if they're using the hedging strategy for uh, for the fu uh, fuel so the premiums that they land up paying over a period of time really accumulate and cause uh, their uh, pnl to suffer so yeah this uh, before i end happy diwali and, uh, and thank you i can take some questions Questions here? Thanks for a lot of detailed presentation. Yeah, I forget your name. Rohil. Rohil. Yeah. So, you know, when Jet Away shut down, there was Correct. one tweet by Anand Mahindra which went viral. Okay. And somebody asked him, why don't you buy Jet Airways and make it Mahindra Airways? Right. And Anand Mahindra, you must have seen the reply to that tweet. He says that if you want me to buy that airline and make it Mahindra Airways. I'll start by becoming a billionaire and after I buy that airline, I'll become a millionaire. Yeah. And this seems to be the story across the world. Correct. So it doesn't seem to be a really a good business to be in. And even when Rajiv spoke about Indigo, right. of course, he gave a also a wonderful presentation. It seemed pretty clear that Indigo was like a one-off story in India. The others didn't match that efficiency standard. So, what's the problem with this airline if so many people are flying? So, uh, it's not that this industry cannot make you money. Uh, if you take US, for example, Southwest, Delta, all of these companies have given decent performance in terms of stock price returns also for their investors. But when you come, uh, the capital, uh, capital allocation, the choices that they have to make whether to buy an aircraft or lease it, or whether to have one particular model uh, within your fleet, only the A320s, or you have uh, Airbus and Boeing fleets at that time. So the decisions that you make at the management level in these aspects really uh, determine what your performance is going to be. Because as we saw the fixed nature of the costs, when a downturn comes, and it will, because it's a, it, it is going to be a cyclical market, uh, cyclical industry, right? So when the downturn comes, that's when you. That's their key. Uh, that's the key moment where they actually have to be able to manage their costs. And if they have various different models in their portfolio, they'll have that much more maintenance costs and so on. And with the cash outflow happening, if you can't service your debt, it will definitely lead you to uh, default on your debts. Question. I sure. mean, it seemed like a no-brainer that Max aircraft had to be grounded, right. but they are still flying. Right. So is it because of the enormous political cloud that Boeing enjoys? So no, in fact, the MAX aircrafts have been grounded since March and they still haven't come into service. So uh, on, this is in fact the longest uh, grounding that has happened in the history of the aviation industry. Uh, but yes, uh, on to, in terms of the political influence that is there in the uh, markets, it, it is tremendous and there is definitely a lot of pressure. It is only probably because of the number of lives that were lost that there is so much uh, uh, talk happening about this particular aircraft and why uh, each independent uh, country's agency is looking into... So, uh, for let's say for India, you have the DGCA or for Europe, you have EASA, which is the uh, aircraft body. So, they all said that once the FAA approves the 737 MAX after the changes that they have to make to the software and so on, they will independently verify these aircrafts. So in that sense, yes, uh, they, have taken the, uh, they have taken the decision to ground the aircraft, but 
the influence that they have at the political level is always going to remain high because of the uh, foreign exchange earning potential of these companies. There are only two players in the market and with each aircraft costing you roughly 50, 60 million dollars, that is the level of foreign exchange that you are earning for the country. In fact, Boeing is the largest uh, uh, foreign exchange earner for, uh, in terms of manufacturer for uh, US in today's day. There is no aircraft flying in the sky today with this Max Pratt & Whitney engine anywhere in the world? Max, no. Pratt & Whitney engines is still flying. So, your uh, Pratt & Whitney engine issues have been seen in certain uh, Airbus models like the A320neo or the A220 very recently. But that is being investigated but they haven't been grounded yet. Yeah, Max is completely grounded. So Spice Jet has, I think, 30 uh, 737 Maxes in their portfolio. So they're all grounded. So what uh, Spice Jet did is they took some of uh, Jet Airways' uh, 737, the normal earlier versions, the 737. They leased it for a very short period so that they have the capacity and they can maintain the market share and still not lose out on a lot, a lot of revenue. But it has definitely impacted them. This kind of a grounding episode, who loses, the lessee or the lesser? So, it's still not clear in that aspect, but uh, definitely Boeing will have to compensate. So, where the uh, issue actually lies, that really has to be investigated. And in this aspect, Boeing has claimed that, yes, there were some issues with the software. And uh, so, Boeing will have to compensate, but what the level of compensation will be is still unclear. Uh, yes, I was wondering, uh, have you done any study of the company which is leasing all these aircraft? Because they must be raising a tremendous amount of money to be able to finance all these airline operators and uh, where do they get their money from and how do they raise it? Uh, so I actually haven't studied uh, uh, leasing companies. Uh, definitely be an interesting look, so I won't, uh, I don't have the answer for that, unfortunately. Do you know what's the share of Airbus post this over period? Because I think the Airbus has a good inventory levels okay. in the mid-size segment. So, of in terms of the exact market share, uh, it's difficult to tell. Uh, although they do report their uh, how much deliveries they've been making per year, but if you're talking in the aspect whether uh, they've gained market share due to uh, Competitive, like the airlines switching, uh, switching the choice of fleet. That has still not happened because, because if you already have 737 or any Boeing models within your airplane, you'd ideally like to prefer and stick it out with that aircraft despite all of these groundings. So in that essence, the companies haven't still switched over. But the more this prolongs, or in that, as, in that essence, if you do start seeing some companies switching over, that would definitely be, uh, that, that would definitely have an impact on Boeing's market share. But right now, it will be more uh, biased towards Airbus because Boeing, uh, so this particular aircraft accounts for roughly 75-80% of their deliveries in any given year. So if you're, uh, and there is only one model in the single aisle aircraft uh, with Boeing. So the moment you ground that, the market share is definitely going to be a lot more biased in, uh, in favor of Airbus. So what happens to the, uh, the old, older orders that were there for the MAX planes? Right. You know, so now that they are grounded, what happens to, you know, uh, if, if say SpiceJet has placed the uh, order for delivery of MAX planes, do they take the deliveries or, you know, how does that work? So, uh, they're not allowed to deliver these aircrafts to the airline operators as yet, but also there have not been cancellations of any of these orders as yet. Uh, what in fact has happened is, that's why Boeing has continued to manufacture these aircrafts and the moment they get the go-ahead from the regulatory agencies to uh, deliver these aircrafts, they will have sufficient airplanes within their own inventory. So, if we even see, uh, there are some theories that the stock price also hasn't fallen so much because the investors are thinking the moment this airplane will come back into service, they will sell all the aircrafts and it will be back to business as no, uh, usual. 
so in that essence uh, they still they're not allowed to deliver these aircraft so they still live with boeing and the inventory cost is being paid by boeing so if uh, you know if if airlines airline operators had placed orders they're expecting deliveries right so are they looking at substitutes for that period of time while you know, there's a ground yeah so some may have deferred their uh, pro uh, production schedule or uh, deferred their capacity expansion and some in case of let's say uh, uh spice jet so they had to take uh, more airplanes from jet airways so jet airways had luckily for them they had uh, failed and so all their entire fleet was just uh, lying so uh, they could easily take those aircraft and put them into service so even with the if you happen to lease an aircraft it is easier and faster to get an aircraft rather than wait for a completely fresh uh, aircraft with the aircraft manufacturer uh roll uh in term i just wanted to know what are the return ratios in terms of roc for the oem manufacturers and for the fleet operators in india if you to right uh, so for uh, boeing and airbus the roc ratio uh, the roc is at 70 80% levels but this is also because of a lot of share buybacks that they do over a period of time uh, in terms of fleet operators again this is the last couple of years is more volatile uh, due to the increase in the uh, uh, fuel prices and so on so it depends on the year and the raw material so there is no set pattern as to what uh, return ratios they would generate uh, yeah. you said that uh, they plan for 20 years or these companies right. airbus and boeing right. they right. plan for 20 years now china aspi aspiring to come to commercial jet market correct and uh, knowing china uh, do you think that that tw tw 20 years planning are going to uh, remain as it is or you see uh, major changes in their plan and price structures and lease structures and all that so uh, yeah so your uh, question is very valid uh, whether uh, the chinese manufacturer will be able to gain some market share or not but it is really uh, difficult for the chinese manufacturer as well so the comac has been in operation since a very long period of time but they also face a lot of these issues in terms of meeting production schedules and so on and their aircraft haven't necessarily been proven as cost efficient for the airline operators which is why till date you see even in china mainly they use airbus and boeing fleets so the mix in china will uh, be roughly like 50 to 55% to uh, airbus and for, uh, 45 to 50% with uh, boeing so that ideally because of, uh, plus the r&d costs and so on that go into developing as we saw the length of the development time is anywhere from 7 to 10 years and comac and all these manufacturers are generally producing just the really small aircraft which are comparable to embraer and bombardier so to compete effectively with airbus and boeing will definitely is a herculean task for them so whether it will significantly move i'm a little skeptical on that but it could always happen definitely i've got uh, two different types of questions first one is uh, how difficult it is to for a new entrant in aviation market to uh, procure aircraft um, so particularly you know i know there is a order backlog with um, oems but what is the inventory available with the less lessers leasing companies right. so uh, to acquire a new aircraft completely it definitely has more than a years worth of backlog so at the oem level the uh, the backlog is as long as minimum one year so to acquire an aircraft it will generally take them longer and that is it uh, is it just aspect. one year i thought it was seven minimum years. one year i'm saying minimum one year it can be definitely longer so they have uh, so at least for these smaller aircrafts their backlogs are as uh, so they have orders placed for the next seven to eight years so it is really really long i'm saying minimum depending on the size of the aircraft also so the business model that uh, that the new entrant wishes to follow whether they want to be a full service carrier or they want to be somebody who's a low cost carrier so that also depends as to which model and what the backlog is for that particular model itself 
but if you take the example of just the smallest aircraft the orders have already been uh, filed and on Boeing's and Airbus's balance sheet you'll see that uh, the orders are already there for the next seven to eight years. In terms of leasing companies, uh, it is definitely faster for them to uh, uh, lease a uh, the aircraft. So it, again, there it would depend on what the age of the aircraft they wish to uh, lease. It, it can be a completely like a relatively new aircraft which is just one two years old, or an aircraft which is as old as ten years. So what they decide to go ahead, the backlog would again be uh, different based on that. I am thinking that. Uh uh, if it is such a bad industry for, uh, for in terms of profitability, you know, around the world, many airlines must be going bankrupt now and then. So there must be pretty good inventory with the leasing companies, which they can right. release to somebody else, uh, right? Right. So, uh, so even on the slide, uh, they have roughly thousand uh, to 1300 that is minimum there on their uh, balance sheets. But uh, yeah, you have a lot of these companies still doing very well. So you have Ryanair in the UK, or you have uh, Southwest, Delta. All of these companies have done fairly well, and they have perfected their business models as far as they could over, uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, so as to be competent even during a downturn. So in that essence, it's not necessary that these companies uh, uh, go bankrupt. But it's more due to what the management quality is like and what kind of decisions did they uh, take uh, when they started off the company. So what the business model actually is plays a really important role whether you want to service the international market as well as the domestic market or just the domestic market it's very important for them to define it right at the beginning. Okay. The second question is you know like uh, China is a very big uh, bullet train uh, capacity and they, are, right. they have been executing it very fast. How much of that is a competition to the airlines? And similarly, bullet trains are being uh, expanded in uh, Europe as well. Correct. So uh, definitely, uh, again that will depend on what uh, their costing for those uh, particular bullet trains are the ticket prices. So if they land up being somewhere similar to an aircraft, then you wouldn't see too much, so it will then depend on the moment when you're actually purchasing the ticket that okay this is more cost efficient for me, I'll go, I'll go via this route. If the time taken is more or less the same, then it's more, then it comes down to what the actual pricing will be. So that can only be discussed when we know, once the network is built and uh, once we know what the fares are like in that bullet, tra uh, bullet train. But even even, uh, even with bullet trains being there in China or Japan, you still have a sizable fleet and a sizable number of passengers traveling by air itself. So in that terms, the scope for the Indian market is still there and it will definitely grow in terms of passenger volumes at least. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take questions from Bangalore now. So my first question is what percentage of uh, the fleet by uh, by airline uh, companies is typically leased versus what percentage is owned by them. So some of these companies like uh, SpiceJet or Indigo or even AirAsia, they have decided to go for all of the aircrafts to be leased. Whereas uh, Air India used to try and own a lot of the aircraft. So in fact, because of the cash crunch today. What they did is some of the bigger airlines that they owned, uh, they they underwent something called sale and lease back. So what they did is to try and raise money, they sold these airplanes to a third party and leased it back immediately so that they get some capital infusion. So currently at least in terms of leasing versus owning, uh, these companies generally land up taking a more conscious decision at least in terms of Indigo or SpiceJet that they are only going to use a, a leasing model. Yeah, my, my, my second question was uh, you said the uh, typical planning cycles are longer. Uh, does that um, uh, have an effect on the management as well? Does it, uh, is it typically the management stays longer or they groomed internally? How does it work? Sorry, uh, can you just repeat that one more time? Yeah, the question was their planning cycles are longer. Right. Uh, essentially, they plan for forward 40 uh, for 20 years, and their uh, 
uh, aircraft delivery also takes uh, seven eight years meaning right. from conception to delivery right. does it have an effect on uh, the management do they does the management typically stay longer uh, how do they uh, how do they ensure that the management doesn't uh, right. change plans uh, so it while it stays so yeah. uh, if i have uh, understood you correctly uh, you're asking uh, how the management uh, quality is in terms of whether if the management was to change how it can ensure continuity considering the 20 year uh, horizon period that they have correct uh, so in that sense uh, what happens is because the backlog is already there for these aircrafts and uh, these aircrafts already there is a set production uh, schedule it doesn't really affect the company's operations immediately when uh, a new management or there's a change at the management level. But uh, you will see the impact of these new managements only after three, four years in the backlogs. So until then, uh, you will have no impact in your, you will generally have no impact in your normal operations. Hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, the government uh, had this Udan scheme launched. Did it affect the demand generation? And do you see uh, uh, increase in uh, leasing or buy buying of the aircraft because of specifically because of Udan? So uh, I'm not able to uh, answer whether specifically because of Udan there has been rise in uh, the orders. But uh, definitely, uh, they have been going in for capacity expansions a little more aggressively uh, than before. So uh, the moment Jet Airways also fell, uh, you saw the other airline operators trying to grab uh, the airlines that were already grounded from Jet Airways uh, and so on. So in terms of capacity expansion, they are going in for a slightly more aggressive uh, plan at the, at the moment. Hi, uh, Hello. that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So I had one question. So uh, you mentioned that the on the uh, manufacturing side, the, ma the market share is broadly between two guys. Yeah. So it's really uh, like concentrated on 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 the, on, on the supplier side Correct. and fairly uh, distributed on the on the uh, aircraft operator side. Correct. But you also mentioned that these guys give a huge discount. Uh, to their list price. Correct. So why would that be? Because I mean, I mean, uh, usually it doesn't happen if the, if the manufacturing or I mean, in the uh, the supplier bargaining power usually should be very high given the concentration is very high. So if you could just broadly uh, sure. share your your thoughts on that. Good question. So uh, what happens is actually when these new models are launched, at that time uh, it is really important for them to prove the fuel efficiency of these new aircrafts because the uh, company can claim that there is 15-20% more fuel efficient aircraft but it can't be proven until they're actually being used and once as you see uh, region specific as well if the one of the airlines starts using especially the market leader starts using uh, a particular model majority of the uh, competitors will also use the same model so as to save on certain costs. So in that essence, it's important for them to gain the first entry uh, into the uh, with that model into that particular airline operator. Hence, you see these high discounting levels, but uh, especially at the initial stages. Uh, so what, which is why they try and ma uh, recover back a lot of these costs from their maintenance operations. So even that uh, is determined by how much volume they are sold initially. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have any questions from Bangalore. Thank yeah, we'll take questions from Delhi now. Hi, so I have one question. So which companies are the most capital efficient in the entire value chain? And are there any uh, Indian companies which are catering to the entire industry, like, uh, like a software company like Aselia Kale or something like that? So, uh, in terms of value chain, uh, uh, it would be difficult for me to answer that question. But uh, if you ask in terms of airline operators versus the aircraft manufacturer, I would say that the aircraft manufacturer is slightly more capital efficient considering the costs that the airline operators have to incur on a year on year basis, which is more or less fixed in nature. 
the engine manufacturers also have a similar uh, allocation efficiency as compared to the uh, airline operators. So they also follow roughly the same business model as the aircraft manufacturers. Yeah, on this I have a follow-up question. So, are there any Indian companies which are catering to the industry which are listed, which are there in listed uh, space? So, uh, at least uh, so we have Hindustan Aeronautics, but that's on the defense uh, side. It's not catering to the commercial uh, aircraft operations. On the commercial aircraft operations, you will mainly see only Boeing and Airbus in the world. In terms of ancillary companies, there will be plenty of ancillary companies, but uh, companies which have a Signi uh, which uh, manufactures a critical component? Uh, I don't think there are any uh, listed companies in the in India at least. Yeah, no more questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we can okay. proceed for dinner. Thank you. Whenever things got rough, I always remember what my father used to say. Running a business does test a man, my son. There are ups and downs. Glorious eyes. And sometimes a low, that leaves you feeling defeated. The character of a man and the character of a business are not very different, are they? Yes. But when the chips are down, we must stand up, dust ourselves off, and motor on. Volatility, it's a funny thing. It makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions. Sure, you can question some of your decisions, but stay steadfast on your goals. Dad always said, there are no shortcuts and no quick profits. There are no free lunches, are there? There is only one right way. At PPFAS, we think like Rahul and his father. That volatility is a fact of running a business. And buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business. We use value investing principles to manage your money. This means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term. PPFAS Mutual Fund. There's only one right way. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.